flavor of money that advances many of our uh, deep tech and scientific based companies here in Illinois and throughout the United States as this is a federal program. Today we, is the first of four workshops that we are doing. Um, they will be each Wednesday from now until May 12th at noon. Um, and if you, I believe all of you should be, have gotten information if you registered for this, so you should have all those dates. Um, we will remind you about each workshop. Uh, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. We are recording this session as Kathy notes below, and we will be uh, dropping some uh, information and resources that are available to you. Without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Alex Gorsuch, who is going to lead today's session. Thanks for being here, and we're excited to have you all. Thanks. All right, awesome. So thanks first, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, the CIBR program is, is really a, a wonderful, wonderful program that we have here in the US that really spurs innovation. And in my mind, it's one of the key components to our national security advantage. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk for uh, probably around half an hour, maybe slightly longer, um, but I'm sure y'all would rather spend time asking me questions and getting answers rather than hearing me drone on and on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to jump into it. All righty. And just let me know once that pops up. Someone. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. There's always one to, person. And just to clarify, Alex, as you use your lingo of SIBRs as the acronym, but Small Business Innovation Research Program, otherwise known by Alex and some in the SBIR community as SIBRs, if you hear him say that. Thanks, Alex. Thank you for clarifying, Laura. All right, awesome. So uh, as mentioned, this is put on by the FAST Center of Illinois, um, which is yet another goofy federal, uh, fe federal acronym. It stands for the Federal and State Technology Center of Illinois. Um, we're one of 24 SBA funded centers for excellence for SBIRs throughout the country. We are here to provide all kinds of free and awesome help for y'all. Uh, this takes the form of Cyber 101s, which are held the second and fourth Wednesday of every month from 1200 to 1300. Uh, we have office hours, which are from three to five every Wednesday. Um, we have sprints, like the one y'all are in now, um, as well as newsletters. Uh, and when I'm going through my presentation, which will be shared with y'all after, please note that if it's blue, it is a link. So you can click on things on this page, for example, to sign up for the newsletters, to go to our calendar, to book office hours, and uh, find out more about our 101s, et cetera. All righty. So want to dive into the timeline a bit. Um, so today is a bit of a hefty lift. Uh, we're going to go through an overview of the Cyber program, as well as a checklist. We're going to talk some Cyber red readiness. Uh, we're going to talk topic selection, value proposition, as well as technical objectives. So what are the goals of this program? The SBIR and STTR program uh, is to meet federal R&D needs. It's to increase private sector commercialization of innovation that's derived from federal R&D funding. In short, it's to stimulate technological innovation and foster and encourage participation by underrepresented communities. For the STTR program, it's to foster tech transfer through cooperative R&D between small business and research institutions like universities, national labs, DOD labs, et cetera. So what do you have to be to take part in this really cool program? First, you have to be for profit. If you are a nonprofit research institution, you can partner with for profits for the small business tech transfer program. You have to be 51% or more US based, meaning 51% or more of your equity holders have to be US citizens or permanent resident aliens. You have to have less than 500 employees, and that's the average number of employees over the past year. <clears throat> that's based on the SBA standard. Uh, and if you have affiliates, parent companies, child companies, VCs, any other permutation, uh, those have to follow those same requirements on employees and ownership. The biggest thing, though, is you have to be pursuing true R&D. These are not grants to just purchase equipment, commercialize an existing technology, or one that is very low risk and only needs capital. Additionally, the place of work performance 
must be in the US. Um, and as I'm going through, please feel free to come off mic and ask a question or say it in chat and one of the other awesome folks from the FAST Center will answer your question. All righty, before I get into the nitty gritty, I wanna say one thing. There's a checklist of things you have to go through to do business with the federal government. Fortunately, it's not too much of a lift. Um, you have to first and foremost, have your entity formed. As I said in the previous slide, you know, number of employees, ownership must be for profit, all that fun stuff. But at its core, you do need a for-profit business entity. And then you need your Duns and Bradstreet, your system for award management, and your cyber.gov registration. Now, each of these is totally free. I know many people, many founders, who've personally paid around seven to $8,000 for something they could do in an afternoon while watching Netflix. There is no private organization that will register you for these systems any faster or any better or anything. Uh, the other thing to note is to do it right now, like immediately after we get off this call right now. Uh, I get a lot of heartbreaking calls uh, and emails about how people missed the deadline or, um, you know, didn't fill out something correctly or, or whatever. So if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to the FAST Center. That's what we're here for. Uh, and then finally, I've only got four of them here, um, but each agency does have a discrete website to register on. For DHS, they have their platform. DOD uses the Defense Cyber Innovation Portal. Uh, NIH uses ERA Commons. NSF uses Fastlane, et cetera. All right, so here is the crazy slide that might shock some of you. So the least, one of the least important parts of getting a SIBR is actually writing the proposal. And I know that sounds totally crazy and you're looking at me all skeptical, but it's true. What's infinitely more important is preparing your venture for success. Getting in contact with the customers you need to talk to, discovering their needs, securing the financing you need. These things will make your company much better positioned. And then a good proposal, while not an afterthought, is significantly easier to follow. <clears throat> Excuse me, significantly easier to write and to get funded. Uh, so to be competitive, you have to meet the CIBR program goals, which I outlined on slide four or so. Uh, you have to have state-of-the-art technology and bibliography. You have to really understand the current state of the art and be really pushing the envelope in tech dev. <clears throat> you have to have a strong connection with your customer base, and this includes letters of support. So the best kind of letter of support is from someone who's essentially saying, I'm a customer, this solves our problem, and I'm willing to take action to solve that problem. Now, cash is, of course, the best kind of action a customer can take, but pilots can also be helpful. You just, you want to signify that the agency, that you really understand the problem and that you're positioned for success by solving that problem and that your customer knows it too and can write a letter of support in support of that. You have to have a qualified team, a sound, good research plan that's very in-depth. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about this closer to the end. But anyone skilled in the art should be able to pick up your cyber work plan and produce it themselves. <clears throat> it has to be high risk, big payoff. You're pushing the envelope here and developing cool new technologies that are often too early for venture financing. You have to have a strong basis for optimism, both from your team in terms of the qualified folks you have on your side, your tech in terms of pushing the envelope, and your traction in terms of the customer discovery and customer traction that you've had. <clears throat> and you have to be at the appropriate stage of development. So this is a fantastic system. Uh, it's called Technology Readiness Levels. It was first pioneered by NASA in like the early 80s, um, used all over, particularly in DOD and NASA now. Um, but essentially, it's these readiness of technologies. And this varies based on agency. That's why they're arranged. But typically for your phase one, they're looking around six to around two um, to fund. Uh, your CIBR phase two, uh, that's your, uh, your TRL eight to TRL five. Uh, like I said, that does vary a bit based on agency, but that's generally a pretty good metric to go by. All right, and some green lights for the CIBR program. 
So you really want to be pushing new technology, which is advancing the scientific body of knowledge. You're not just building widgets that people have before. <clears throat> and you want to have it ready to develop into practice. Your, your venture needs to be positioned to, if you get this funding, you can meaningfully build the product and meaningfully take action and actualize that customer feedback into dollars and de-risk that business for the federal government. You need to have evidence of actual customer demand. Sales is really awesome um, for earlier versions of what you're trying to develop, um, as are letters of support that have revenue coming in, uh, really showing that the customer cares about what you're building and they're gonna be motivated enough to take action. You need to show that you understand distribution channels, costs, methods, and players. And the company needs to be able to support commercialization as well as business development costs. Because you're not just building cool widgets on the government's dime here. You're building cool widgets that are going to solve actual problems for actual customers with actual money. And you need to be able to meet that forecasted demand. The leaders of your project need to be very qualified. They really need to be the preeminent experts in your field. <clears throat> and you need to have realistic goals and expectations. You need to have well-rounded experience on the team and address major societal concerns. So some red flags on the CIBR program. <clears throat> if you're just doing modest incremental technology improvement, just taking existing technology, applying it in a new way, et cetera, that probably isn't going to be very compelling to the agencies. Uh, if you're not really up on the latest research in your field, um, or if you're really too focused on the technology, because these aren't just grants to build product, products. They are grants and contracts, depending on the agency, to build real technology for real customers with real dollars that you can exchange. Um, if you just, you know, get some IBIS world reports, et cetera, to talk about your market demand and your market size estimates, but can actually meaningfully show uh, that customer contact and that customer discovery, then you may not be ready yet for the CIBR program. Uh, if you're not aware of how the product gets to the customer, the competition, the marketing landscape, et cetera, you're maybe still not ready. And finally, <clears throat> If you're expecting grant dollars to fund all of your business development, or if you're not prepared to spend a lot of time on the proposal, um, then you might not be ready for the CIBR program. Alrighty, so uh, another thing here is a readiness self-assessment. Um, please use this yourselves and, and you know, just be honest about where your business is. If you're not ready for the, the CIBR program, um, or if it's just not a fit for you, that's totally okay. There's plenty of businesses out there who succeeded without the CIBR program, but this is a really great um, arrow in your quiver for the trifecta of funding between strategic, dilutive, and non-dilutive funding. So think about how innovative the technology is, how ready your, your business is, your venture is, to actualize on that uh, new technology and sell it. Uh, if you have evidence of customer demand and awareness of the market, if your team is qualified uh, and can actually make and sell the widget that you're trying to get uh, Uncle Sam's dollars to build, and if you have realistic and clear goals. You wanna have broad societal benefits and overall just think about how strong and how weak is your venture. More importantly, as I said, having a venture that's uh, poised for success and has everything in place for success, far more important for the cyber process than the writing of the proposal. Uh, so really be honest with yourself and, you know, seek, seek honest and candid feedback from mentors and others in your ecosystem that you trust. Alrighty. So uh, another thing y'all can work on is a topic selection. Uh, so if you go to cyber.gov, you'll see topic headings there. Uh, and we're going to work on a topic and around five sentences of reasoning, why it's a good fit, why your venture is uniquely posed, poised to take advantage of it, et cetera. And then your value proposition. So uh, I like to call this startup Mad Libs, and uh, you should know this in your sleep, but be able to clearly and concisely elucidate very specifically who your target customer is, 
what is the goal they're trying to meet? What are they unhappy with? Or what are they wishing for? You know, what's the pain that you're eliminating or the gain that you're providing? What is your product with as few of buzzwords as possible? Uh, what compelling value does it provide, right? People don't just buy technology because it's cool. In fact, they really don't care about technology at all. They care about their problems. And if your technology can provide a clear, compelling solution to those problems at an appreciable price point and way of acquisition better than others in the field, then it might be compelling. Think about your competitors and your alternatives. Uh, and if you think you don't have a competitor, then you are uh, sorely fooling yourself. Everyone has a competitor, even if it's just ignoring the problem. Uh, and the key features that you've assembled. Again, avoiding buzzwords and always trying to relate it back to the customer. Because it's really, really easy to build cool tech. But it's hard to build cool tech that real customers with real dollars actually care about. Uh, if you're going the NSF route, there's a project pitch where you spend 500 words each talking about the innovation and technical objectives and challenges, uh, market opportunity and company and team at 250 words each. So strong proposals have three key elements. Technical risk. You're, you're not just building product here. You're, you're really trying to push the envelope and build something new. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the commercialization side, you need to show evidence of that consumer contact. You need to show that you understand who's your buyer, who's your end user, who's your decision maker, who's your saboteur, <clears throat> who's your influencer, who's your recommender. Uh, and for some markets, who's your regulatory agent, who's your transactional and operational stakeholder. And what do each of them want? And how are they currently solving their problems? And finally, your team. You need to have a very strong team that are leaders in the field. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about this later in the sprint. But of key note here is you're going to need to have a principal investigator. And this principal investigator needs to be real top notch. Uh, but most importantly, they must have 21.4 or more hours free to devote to the business. Uh, and that does not mean that they can work 10 hours here, 12 hours here. Uh, according to the federal government, there is a 40 hour work week and 51% or more time of your PI must be spent on the venture. Alrighty, so quick note regarding i -Corps. Um, I know we've got some MWIN participants here or others who have gone through our site i -Corps. Uh, if you have not, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, I've been teaching i for years, and I still send my teams uh, through i for my own venture. Uh, it's a really fantastic program. Uh, it's an intense customer discovery process that's based on the Lean Launchpad. Um, and teams that go through it are five to six times more likely to get CIBR funding after going through the National NSF program. Uh, here is a link to our UIUC application. <clears throat> Alrighty, and be thinking from day one, what are the technical objectives and aims that you're going to want to pursue? So what exact objectives need to be accomplished to prove the technical feasibility? And I don't mean that you're just going to write, oh, I want to build X and it's going to work. I mean that you need thresholds. So for example, in a recent NSF proposal that I got funded, uh, we were building a, uh, a device to extract uh, aqueous humor from the eye. It was a surgical tool for ophthalm ophthalmologists. And we didn't just say, oh, we want to build it. Um, for one of the tests, we needed to dive into how well our custom needle set um, could pierce the eye and extract the fluid without causing discomfort in the patient. So for us, we had said, and this is very specific, uh, you know, we will rent a Chatelon LCTM 1000 motorized force tester from Berwick, Pennsylvania. And we will start with 2.2 mill millimeters of polyurethane foil, which is a you know, substitute for human eyes and the cornea and blah, blah, blah. Here's our reference to that. Um, and we will start with our custom needle set positioned two millimeters above this foil. And we will lower at a rate of 0.1 millimeters per second until we have pierced that foil by one millimeter. During that time, we will be recording corneal entrance force. And then we will withdraw 
at the same speed, back up to two millimeters, et cetera, recording the corneal exit force. And the key is that we also had a failure, a pass failure threshold, where we said the current existing standard is six newtons of force. And if we get less than five newtons, then we have passed this test as we will be technically, um, as we will be uh, verifiably and quantitatively better than our competition at causing less discomfort to the patient. And if we don't, then we will iterate in this way. We will, you know, we will iterate on the anterior bevel angle by half a degree until we are under that five Newton threshold. Now that was a ridiculously specific example, but like I said, it needs to be ridiculously specific. It needs to be very, very clear what you're gonna do and what is that risk that you're overcoming. So a pro tip here is to look at the materials and methods section of a close research paper. Find one in your field and go way more in depth. It should be very clear to any reviewer exactly what you're gonna test, exactly how you'll know when you pass fail and exactly what you're gonna do if you failed. All right, so uh, for week one, uh, start today, get your DUNS number, get your SAM number, get your cyber.gov registration out of the way. Uh, if you wanna do one of these agencies, or another, there's 11 agencies who provide for the CIBR and STTR program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, register that today, all of this. Get started. I don't wanna get sad emails or hear through the grapevine that an awesome team was denied due to something as, as, as uh, banal as missing a registration deadline. Uh, I'd recommend you go through your CIBR readiness self-assessment, topic selection and reasoning, value proposition, your project pitch, if you wanna go the NSF route. Um, and by the way, if you wanna write up a project pitch for no matter which agency you're pursuing, it's good practice. And you can have people read through that to give you feedback. All right, like I said, I wanna spend most of this time answering questions. So I saw quite a bit in the chat. So let me just hop in there and see if there's any unanswered questions. We have several, Alex, maybe you can address about whether a company owner can be the PI and are these one and the same? Um, certainly, yeah, yeah, I, I see that very, very often. Um, yeah, so in some ways, if they're not, that can present problems because it's very hard to find a PI and it's hard to keep a PI motivated. Speaking from personal experience, it's difficult to keep a PI motivated for the four-ish months, depending on the agency, that it takes between submitting the proposal and getting feedback, it's very difficult to keep that person to not fill their time with other things. Because you need a PI who's, who's motivated and diligent and, and entrepreneurial and technically skilled. And um, those are in-demand skill sets. Did that answer your question, Rosalba? Yes, it did. Um, I was just wondering if there was a conflict of any sort, if, if we have to devote, you know, a certain amount to, to the university as faculty, mm. and will that interfere with the company time? That, it is often hard to, to get faculty to serve as PI for that exact reason. Um, so, if you can make that 19.6 hours or less employed anywhere else work for your, um, I'm presuming the university here, Rosalba, I believe mm -hmm. here at UIUC, is that correct? Yes. Uh, if you can get them working, if you can get that worked out here, great. Um, if, if you cannot, um, honestly, there's, there's really no way around it. Maybe you have to get in a situation where you have to choose. Maybe you have a really awesome postdoc in your lab who can, you know, serve as PI or, you know, someone in your personal network. Um, but what you absolutely cannot do is try and pull a fast one on Uncle Sam and, uh, you know, try and do both without, without his knowledge. Uh, that is a federal crime and uh, no one should do federal crimes. <laughs> and maybe we can, Jed, you want to jump in here too. So this is a common question we get. Can I be a faculty member in the PI? And we generally would say no. Um, Roland, I know you get this question all the time as well. So Alex, thanks for the suggestion. Postdocs are a good choice if they can move into this role. There are others that might be qualified, but they have to understand the science very well also. 
Jed? Yeah, I'll just uh, th thanks, Laura, and, and thanks, Alex. And Roland, you can chime in as well. You cannot be full time at the university and be a PI as well. So it's it's they're very clear. It's it's very clear and very specific in the in the information that you can't. Alex said it's forty hour week, and you cannot work more than at Roland. What's the specific hours that you cannot be working anywhere else? A nineteen point six. That you cannot be working more than nineteen point six hours anywhere else. Okay. So that's very, very specific. So if you are working more than 19.6 hours anywhere else in any other jobs combined, then you cannot be the PI. Right, and Mariana just asked about a faculty member getting a release and that works, but it's risky. If a faculty member gets a release, say for a year to do a phase one proposal, and then you get phase two funding, the faculty member usually has to go back to being a faculty member for phase two and you'd need to find somebody else to be PI for phase two. And it's yeah. not a given that you can just switch PIs. Yeah, and, and Roland, the other, the other thing I'll, I'll address is that it has to be for that entire period of the, of the proposal. So if you get a phase one for one year, you have to have that, you, you have to meet that criteria the entire time of the proposal. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. It used to not be like that, but it, that's how it is now. So you have to have, you have to be qualified the entire time. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, I had a question if I can speak now or is, should I post it in the chat? Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was uh, kind of just wondering how to determine if you are like strictly R&D and if if that if you're not, let's say, let's say you're trying to make a product that doesn't have something super new. Um, then would you would you not be able to apply at all, or should, or is it just like your chances might be uh, lower? So how should one go about that if they do think they're bringing something different, but at the same time it's not strictly just it's not research and development. Yeah. So um, I mean, there there it, it's kind of a difficult question to answer, you know, without knowing more specifics. Um, Generally speaking, there are ways to tell um, if it's something that is protectable, um, if it's something where you have a clear, deep dive into the customer base, like with that customer discovery I talked about, and, and you can tell there are technical competitive advantages, defensible advantages, um, that, that can be a way to know. Uh, the other mm -hmm. great thing is with particularly how the NSF is structured now. I mean, you can write a project pitch and uh, it's like 3,000 words. It's like 2,000 word sections and two 500 word sections. You can write it and submit it and send it to them and they'll get back to you within a week and a half. Uh -huh. uh, you know, they don't catch everything and, and you know, by far and away, does them inviting you to submit a full proposal in any way, shape or form a guarantee of funding? Um, but they can usually answer, you know, yes, in principle, this is fundable or, you know, we need some more clarification here or, you know, no this maybe doesn't push the boundaries enough. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I no, appreciate it. And Alex, Roland, Jed, maybe you can talk a little STTR also, because that might be an option for some that are faculty on this call that want to participate in a bigger way. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, sorry, go ahead, Roland. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, the, the STTR program, functions essentially the same as the SBIR program, except with STTR, there's a requirement that the for-profit company that's the prime contractor partner with a research institution. And the research institution has to do at least 30% of the work. So the partnership is required. Now, NIH is the only agency that I'm aware of that allows the research institute participant to be the PI of the whole project. So we've been talking about faculty members as PIs. The rules change a little bit with NIH. If you have an STTR, meaning the for-profit company is partnering with the research institution, the research institution is doing at least 30% of the work, then the faculty member can be PI of both. Jed, what else about STTR should we mention? I think the, the thing to the think about uh, STTR as well is that I think it's functionally, well, other than the, the rule that you have to have a nonprofit and a company working together, as far as reviewing, 
they're exactly the same as SBIR. So I review for the NSF and uh, at least once a year. And as a reviewer, they're exactly the same. They're, you get a stack of papers and you don't even pay attention to whether it's an STTR or an SBIR. Uh, in fact, in, in, unless, the, unless the program director reminds you of like, oh, this one's an STTR proposal, they're exactly the same. I'll also say that uh, I'll, I've had program director or program managers tell us several times that they get very few STTR proposals. So it is a smaller a, a bucket of funding that's available, but they often get fewer STTR proposals. So that's something to consider. So the question here is, I, I, somebody just sent a message to me and asked, are there separate pools of money available? Yes. Uh, it's, it is a smaller pool of money, but they get far fewer proposals for STTRs. The, the difference that I, I recommend to people is that you have to look at your situation, but if you're a company and you're trying to be a, well, you all have to be a company to apply, but if you are full on board for a company, I say go for SBIR because then you don't have to allocate any money to the university and give up overhead. But there are companies that do have to, uh, you know, take that into account uh, with their situation. So make sense? Yeah, I'll Just, also add that there are separate pools, there are fewer STTRs, but you can't predict in any given situation which one's going to be the better bet. That's right. So, so it's not worth trying. I had a situation where a, uh, a bio firm submitted to NIH an STTR, and the program manager liked the project and turned around and said, hey, if you could submit this as an SBIR, I actually have more funds for this program for SBIR. And so they altered the subcontract amount so that it would fit within the SBIR program, and they got funded as an SBIR. And so that's the other point. If the program manager likes what you have, then the program manager will help you find a way to fund it. And I just wanted to clarify, um, Alex and others. So if you want to start a company and you're a faculty of the university, might the STR, T STTR be a better route? Uh, are you thinking of going for NIH funding or NSF funding? It might NIH? actually depend. Okay, NIH. Well, that might be then, but you don't have to decide that when you form the company. You only okay. have to decide that when you write the proposal. Got it. Uh, I just want to add one quick thing on the SBI, two quick things on the SBI versus STTR front. So almost every single time, whenever someone mentions SBIR, they're also talking about the STTR program. As Jed and Roland and everybody said, they, they are really very, very similar. The only difference is that allocation, <clears throat> either the ceiling or whether or the floor. Um, the other thing I will say is, for example, the Air Force, they almost always have less STTR applicants than they have the money for. Does that mean every single STTR applicant gets that Air Force funding? Of course not. <laughs> but food for thought. Um, so I want to answer one of these questions. Is it possible to submit a cyber proposal to multiple agencies to increase the chances like NSF and USDA? Yes, absolutely. With a great big asterisk, you can submit for as many agencies as you have the bandwidth to submit quality proposals for. If you just go nuts and if you just submit a proposal to every single agency with very little thought, the chances of you getting funding are just tiny, don't bother doing that. But, you know, if NSF, USDA, maybe NIST or something is also a fit, awesome, do that, provided they're quality proposals that you can put the work into to deliver a quality product. The big asterisk is if you accept federal money for equivalent work, then that is a federal crime. That being said, if you are in a situation where you are weighing multiple SBIRs that you've just gotten from multiple different agencies, that's a pretty awesome problem to have. And not many firms are in that position. Did that answer your question, Ellie? I'm sorry. I, I was just going to add, there, there are many teams that actually submit uh, uh, proposals to different agencies and they, they submit different work. So they're not submitting overlapping work and they get funding by different agencies. So there's lots of teams at Research Park and Enterprise Works specifically that have, uh, that are funded by maybe, I can think of a couple that were the Navy, funded by the Navy and NSF or NIH and NSF. The key thing, like Alex said, is that they just make sure that they're transparent. So they're letting the program directors know, always be transparent and then make sure that they're not getting funded for the same work. 
just talk to somebody that's done it before. Uh, another quick unsolicited tip that I will say, Jed just spurred it on with his great comment. Uh, talk to your program manager early and often. Um, if you send them, if you send them an email saying in principle, what you're going to do and you know, what you're planning on submit provided they are not with, there's a certain deadline. It's like two months or six weeks or something within the solicitation where they legally cannot answer your question. If it's not within that, that uh, time frame, I have always found program managers to be just incredibly helpful insightful people who can who can really answer a lot of great questions you know they won't answer like you know will you fund this yes or no um but they'll be able to answer you know in principle is it something they would fund in principle does you know the scope look reasonable do you seem ready etc mm -hmm. and and these program managers we can find their contact like uh, uh emails let's see uh, at the website or is there anywhere anywhere specific where we can find that uh yes yeah you can you can put together um you can find them on the website um i will talk with the uh with the others at the fast center about that i just had an idea to maybe increase the reachability of them but we'll get back to you and we'll send out a mass email and maybe specific if they know a solicitation that they're going after alex that might be more clear of who that program manager is Role. And I know you kind of look out for those things as well of where you go and depends on the agency that you're pursuing. Right. With uh, NIH, they list an SBIR agency contact for each institute. And so there, there's an obvious person to contact. And uh, for NSF, they list the program managers. But with NSF, you have the project pitch mechanism, which is probably your best entree with NSF. With NIH, uh, the, one of the keys is to make sure that you are addressing their goals. If you write an email and say, you know, we're, we're doing really great work and we love our work and academia loves it, that's not going to carry as much weight as if you say, I understand what your agency's mission is. I've got a way I think we'll address it. Could I have 20 minutes of your time to talk over the appropriateness of our approach with your institute and the level of interest? Always when you're talking with these people, specify about 20 minutes of time <clears throat> so that they realize that you are respectful of their time. So Alex, are you, uh, I think you're talking to me to come off mute and maybe explain the, uh, yes. yeah. the, uh, uh, the mistake that our company made the last time uh, we submitted for a contract or a, uh, an award. So we did a, an AFWorks SBIR phase one. Um, and uh, the, the thing that held us up was in our SAM registration, there's a, there's a place right at the beginning uh, when you're creating that SAM registration where they ask you the reason for your registration. And uh, I think there's two options. Uh, one is like grants and federal assistance. And then the second option is everything, awards, government contracts, et cetera. And our assumption was wrongly that we were um, submitting for a, a DOD grant when it was actually a DOD contract. And uh, that's that's where we got held up in this last uh, submission. So, uh, if if you're going after DoD funding, uh, make sure you check the all awards button. Is that right, Alex? Did I miss anything there? With uh... no, you're you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's uh, you are certainly not the first firm to make that mistake, nor sadly will you be the last. Um, and if you have any kind of questions throughout that process, um, please schedule some of the fast office hours. Um, it's, you know, we, we really don't want to see, for example, NTS Innovations and Ryan McCoy, you know, get a phase one and, and get held back by, yeah, a checkbox. So on, on, on that note, Alex, I will ask you another question. Um, you know, the, for that AFWorks phase one, they do these uh, cycles fairly frequently, right, with the open topic. Um, in our case, would you recommend that we, we turn around, you know, after correcting the SAM registration, of course, turn around and resubmit the same proposal? Or would you advise, uh, you know, changing that proposal up so it's not the exact same thing? Um, so, They've funded it, so clearly they like the cut of your jib. Um, but June 16th, 
is the next DOD deadline. Uh, it actually just came out like an hour or two ago. Um, use the two months, however long we have until June. Um, show how good I am with the calendar. Uh, use these next couple months to improve further. Um, you know, I know you already had a pretty good uh, LOS in place, um, Ryan. So get another LOS, get a stronger LOS, talk to more airmen, you know, talk to, you know, et cetera. So yes, submit the same thing, but submit an even better version of the same thing with the extra time that you have. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I had another question. Uh, regarding like uh, having a strong team. So let's say if you have only have like a couple team members, like three to four, and half of you are bachelors, graduates, would that affect, um, would that have a negative effect on trying to get an SBIR? Or? I have seen teams that are one person who just finished a, uh, undergraduate degree about three weeks before she was awarded. Uh, oh, wow. One of our research park companies, um, they can't even buy beer legally and they just got a phase one from AFWorks. So, you know, of course, you know, if you've got a team full of PhDs, you know, everyone's serial entrepreneur, like that makes it more likely, certainly. But while team is weighted very heavily, it's also the success of the venture. Remember I said preparing your venture for success is the most important thing you can do to ensure that cyber success. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Maybe that's uh, helpful, Alex, of thinking about faculty who wanna be involved of finding, it doesn't have to be a postdoc, it could be somebody with less educational experience than that that joins forces to become a PI if they find someone. I've seen plenty of, um, Less still an undergrad, but I've seen plenty of recent undergrad um, PIs, so. There's a question about NSF, I, assume, I presume the NSF PFI program versus SBIR program. Jed, do you work with NSF all the time? Maybe this is something you wanna address or Alex? I, I'm happy to, uh, PFI is a phenomenal program. I, I've reviewed for PFI the last few years as well. I would think about PFI is nothing more. So first of all, it stands for Partners for Innovation. It is actually run by Jesus Soriano, who's a former SBIR program director that we know well here on our campus. And, uh, Jesus, and, and the PFI program, think about it as SBIR within the university. Okay. So it, it provides, I believe the funding now is $200,000 for 12 months but the funding goes to a research group at the university. So as SBIR goes to a company, PFI dollars goes to a researcher within the university. So the funding goes to your research lab, okay? And, the, and it's for commercialization, it's for a bit, get proof of concept funding. So I've got a chart that I, I normally share. I could, I could actually pull it up here if I can find it real. I can't find it right now. I'll find it as soon as I get done answering this question. But on, on our pipeline, uh, I would I would show that uh, you know you have it you have an idea you typically go through an I Corps program and then you can get PFI dollars and then after PFI you can go through a national I Corps program or go through SBIR but think of it as pre SBIR if you get uh, a PFI grant you are required to go through the national I Corps program okay but it's a phenomenal program and it, I I would I would suggest everybody try to get it so apply for it. So I think they have two, I think they have two uh, uh, funding mechanisms or two cycles for it uh, during the year. Uh, the question is, how does it differ from a, uh, a research grant? So I think of it as proof of concept funding. So it's towards commercialization. If you're just doing basic research, then you're too early stage for it. Okay. But also it's not going to the company, right, Judd? Yep, so if it's, you're it's, trying to find employees of a company or build a company, this is not that. Nope. Nope. It's, it's think again, think about it like SBIR within the university. So the money goes to a research lab at the university. So I was just scrolling through the chat, looking for uh, missed questions. Uh, Mariana, I saw you asking about if you need to get a P1 before you get a P2. Um, generally, 
speaking, yes, a couple agencies do offer direct to phase twos. Um, going the 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 full gamut from a phase one to phase two is certainly more common, particularly for the NSF, as as Jed had highlighted. Uh, sorry for multiple questions, but um, I don't know, another question regarding the proposal. So is that something you and your team members can submit? Like you don't need any outside help or any thing, or is that do you need some sort of consult? I know you can consult people obviously to get reviewed and whatnot, but I'm just wondering if there's anything else you need to for an actual full proposal. I, I I'm sorry, I, I guess I don't understand. The, I mean, in, as long as you've done your your agency specific registration, you know, your fast lane, your ERA Commons, whatever, as well as like your DUNS number, your SAM.gov, your cyber.gov, all of those bureaucratic registration gobbledygook out of the way, as long as you've done all of those um, and you pass, you know, the requirements to you know, for, for ownership, for, you know, US base, you know, doing, as long as you pass all those requirements, uh, yes, you can submit. Um, I absolutely very heartily recommend um, having, you know, awesome, an awesome group like the FAST Center here, look at your proposal, um, you know, and, and meet with them to increase your chances of success. Um, in a way, I've been a a user of the FAST Center, uh, even long mm -hmm. before it existed. Um, Roland here, who's actually on the call, um, reviewed my very first uh, NSF Cyber proposal. Um, I was like 19 or 20. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't get it. I was too arrogant. I didn't even take advantage of Jed's i program here. Uh, but this was a long time ago. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I Cool. And maybe if I can jump onto this too, if you're submitting an STTR and a portion of that's going to get subcontracted to an educational institution, so the university, wherever you are, you need to get that approved, that scope through their sponsored programs or contract office. So that would require another piece of having another institution involved. But Roland, perhaps you can talk about how you kind of work with somebody and what checkpoints might be appropriate on a one-on-one -on -one basis to get them to submit. They can do it on their own, but I certainly recommend using somebody like Roland. We have a team of experts that can help you through the process. Right, the, uh, um, <clears throat> probably the best time to involve somebody from the FAST Center is very early on in the proposal stage where you've got a concept, you've got an idea, you've got a general notion of what you wanna do and you're asking general questions. You wouldn't have any proposal yet, just an idea talk to us, uh, ask your questions initially. And then myself, uh, as you develop the proposal, I like to work with early material, sketches, outlines, bulleted lists, uh, just a you know, the simple statement of why you think you should be funded so that you can best direct the proposal and best direct the development of the proposal. In developing a proposal, I like to write what I call a case statement, which is just a statement of why you think it should be funded. And then you look at that case statement and you say, okay, how are we going to prove each of these points? How are we going to demonstrate and substantiate that in fact, our work is unique, that in fact, we know what we're doing, that in fact, the team was a good, is good. And a lot of your work in proposal preparation is in developing the material to support your main points not just in writing it up, which is just exactly what Alex mentioned. The bulk of the work is in preparing to substantiate your main points. And so if you work through your main points ahead of time, that guides your proposal development, and that's a much more effective process than if you just take section one, okay, here's the question, we will respond to this one. Section two, okay, here's the question, we will respond to this one. And then you get kind of a disjointed proposal. That's a kind of an overview of how I like to proceed uh, in, in what I'm working with with companies. Does that address, does that answer? Yep, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll say, Roland doesn't write the proposal for you or the other consultants. You're still writing it. It's still your company, um, but he can provide really good bumpers and advice and get you through the process in a way that can much more enhance your success. I know his track record is really incredible of getting to success.
This is uh, somebody who's not at UIUC. Jed, who helps with PFI proposals? I know you work with U of C and other institutions across the state. Is that generally a business manager? Is it their sponsored programs office or what that's named? Or, or who helps on those awards? We have a proposal development office. Honestly, if I was doing, if I was doing a, a putting together a, a PFI, uh, it, they're, they're no different than a proposal that you put together now. I would, I would actually use one of the SBIR program consultants as well to get feedback on it because it has a commercialization aspect as well. But then it just goes, it's just submitted the same way that you submit a normal proposal on your campus. But again, I would actually run it by Roland or someone else to get some, get some feedback on the commercialization side of it as well, because typically your, your uh, grant writers on your campus usually don't, aren't familiar with that commercialization side. But it's, again, it's submitted just how you submit a normal NSF proposal through Fastlane and research.gov. I have a question here. Um, so iCorps was mentioned more than once. Um, what benefits would iCorps give that would like, or like going through the iCorps program uh, would give towards the, the SBR proposal? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I can address that. Um, and, and Jed actually runs our iCorps site here. So Jed, please feel free to jump in. Uh, so from a quantitative perspective, um, teams that have gone through the, I, the national I-Corps program here in Illinois are five to six times more likely to get SBIR and STTR funding. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that there's like, you know, a checkbox on your file and the NSF says, oh, these people went through i -Corps plus 25 points on the threshold. Uh, what it does mean is when I talked about your venture, the best way to write a good cyber proposal is to focus more on prepping your venture for success. i is the best way to do that. So my first business, I built portable modular microbiology labs for the DOD. I was young, I was arrogant. I knew tangentially that i existed. Um, I didn't take advantage of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I thought customer discovery meant, hey, look at this thing that I built. I I'm really smart. You'd, you'd buy this, right? And you'd give me a whole bunch of money and this would solve all your problems. And humans, we've been taught to be polite. Right? We're not going to go, wow, this seems like something you're really passionate about. This is garbage. Get out of my face. We don't do that. We say things like, oh, of course, of course, this, you know, that's what I heard. But yet the money never changed hands. It was only until I went through i that I realized I shouldn't be asking, hey, look at, look at how big my brain is. Look at what I built. Wow. I should be asking, how often do you need to run tests on site? What happens when you're not able to? What are the consequences? Uh, you know, and really focusing more on that problem. Because the problem with tech entrepreneurs is they think their tech matters. It doesn't. It's the customer. The only people who care about your technology are you, your mother, and the T2 office if you license it from somewhere. Nobody else. Your investors don't care about your tech. Your customers certainly don't care about your tech. They care about, are you solving a problem? For real customers with real money who will exchange it for your real technology. And that's what the i -Corps methodology is all about. In the same way that we as tech entrepreneurs build cool, interesting technological things through data-driven empirical methods, i -Corps teaches a methodology of building your commercialization plan through data-driven methods. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's, that's totally clear, yeah. Cool, all right. Uh, I think we are about at wrap. So if anyone has like a one minute question real quick, uh, I could take it. No? Okay, all right. Uh, Jed and Roland, do you guys wanna talk about the next three weeks? I think Jed, you've got the next session, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. <laughs> I will cover. Uh, great. Happy to do it next week. It's next week, right? Yeah. Wednesdays. Commercialization, letters Wednesdays. of support. To... Wednesdays. <laughs> yes. I'm just kidding. I know it's next week. So next week, I'll be covering uh, commercialization plans. And what else are we covering, Roland, next week? Uh, letters of support, customer discovery. And probably you'll talk a little bit more about i -Corps. We've mentioned it quite a bit, but uh, you know, Jed will have more details about the i -Corps program. 
Yeah, so I'll talk about I'll talk about those things, and I will also leave a few minutes at the end to cover what a review panel looks like because I think that's always useful for teams that are submitting. I always find it's useful when I submit SBIR proposal or any proposal to understand what the mechanisms look like behind the scenes, and it helps me as I'm writing proposals uh, to kind of frame the proposals in a certain way if I know how it's being reviewed. So I'll talk about that as well. But again, commercialization plans letters of support, customer discovery, because I always get asked the question, what's the difference between a proposal that's funded and one that's not funded? And so I'll, I'll address that a little bit as well. So Roland? Yeah, the, then uh, session three is going to be kind of a combination. I have got some budget materials that answer people's most common questions about budgets. I will talk a little bit about the overall proposal development timeline. And let's see, I had a third topic. What was my third topic? Anybody have them up here? I put in the chat, Roland, of some of our topics. Budget oh, yeah. Things. I'm going to talk about use of graphics in the in the proposal, effective use of graphics. People don't want to read just blocks of plain text because that <laughs> takes a lot of time for the reviewer to understand. Jed will point it out in, in, paid, in uh, the second session. You've got a very, very limited amount of time to capture the reviewer's attention. And so there are some formatting things you can do to make sure that you get their attention in a positive way so that they want to read more. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then finally, in the fourth one in May is what we'll do is we'll cover some technical objectives. We'll talk about key personnel, PI selection, and then talk about phase two. I always find I've had several program directors tell me over the years that they do appreciate when teams have a long-term vision and they build a phase one, so it's moving into a phase two. And so you're, you're thinking about that. So we'll talk about some strategies about how to make that, uh, make your case for a phase two during your phase one. Kathy and Laura, I believe if they registered for this event, they are already registered for the next sprint sessions. But uh, if either of you can address that, just wanna make sure everybody has the right Zoom link joining us for the next three Wednesdays. Yeah, on the registration page, everyone had the opportunity to select which of the four sessions that they would be interested in attending. So, but yes, the, the Zoom link is the same for all of them. Thanks, Kathy. And I'm just going to put a link back out. Please request one on one assistance if you need it. And I think, Alex, you're going to close out with those registrations that you can do by next week. So you will have something done to help your SBIR journey. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can absolutely. See don't put them up on the screen, but. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, let me put them in the chat real quick. Is that what you meant? Yep, so your okay. SAM registration, all that good stuff that you can get done. All right, there's your Duns and Bradstreet. There's your SAM registration. One more. While you're finding it, Alex, for those that are at the University of Illinois, we have extra assistance for you in getting your companies formed. We've got entrepreneurs and residents. We even have business formation services. So if we can help you beyond the FAST Center with your proposal, please reach out. Um, if you want one-on-one -on -one assistance, you can request it with the link I put in the chat or go to our website. You do need to make that request online so we can triage you to an available consultant to help you further. Um, a lot of that help is going to come from Roland, but Roland only has so many hours in the day. So we would clone him if we could, but unfortunately, everybody wants a little piece of Roland. So we have we have a great team and we will get you help. Um, if you've got general business inquiries, though, consider our entrepreneurs and residents as another option. If you are associated with a university that is not the University of Illinois, but you are in the state of Illinois, there's a good chance we might be able to get you help through another program we have that's Illinois Illinois University Incubator Network. So please stay in touch. We've got resources to help you. And we've got friends around the state at other great entrepreneur centers that might have resources that are available at those other institutions as well. So um, plug on that um, along those lines as Polsky is hosting a great conference this week, Deep Tech U, definitely related to this subject matter. So if you're looking to see other examples of entrepreneurship, check out Deep Tech University this week at Polsky at University of Chicago. It is free to join and it is a three-day event. We're in day two of that event this week. Thank you, everybody.